remember <coughs> is that all our cells of the body, and this includes the hemat hemat hematologic cells as well, or blood cells, originate from a stem cell. So if you look at this, it's a very simple picture showing you that a stem cell uh, develops gradually into progenitors and then from progenitors into different lineages of cells. It could be a, a, a red blood cell, a lymphocyte, a liver, whatever. All the cells develop initially from a stem cell. Now, stem cell has two features, which one is uh, shown here in the by the arrow, and I hope that you will be able to identify. So what are the two major features of a stem cell, any stem cell? Please speak up. That's the differentiating. Uh, so when, um, um, let's say, theoretically speaking, a stem cell divides into two, one will be developing into a certain lineage of a cell, yes? What will happen to the second one? If it develops as well, then we'll lose a stem cell. So what will happen to it? Come here, you. It remains a stem cell and then divides again. One will differentiate, the second will remain as a stem cell. So this is correct. And that's why there are two features of any stem cell. One is self-renewing because one daughter always remains a stem and doesn't develop, doesn't differentiate. And the second is the ability to give rise to any possible uh, the lineage of the, of the cells. It depends on the potency. So some cells, like embryonic stem cells, you can grow the whole body out of it. But then they gradually <coughs> lose their potency, and then you have perhaps stem cells that are capable of only giving rise to a certain number of different lineages. So if you take hematopoietic stem cell, you won't be able to grow a liver out of it. Yes? Because it's already lost some level of plasticity, some level of the potency. Therefore, we can identify three types of the three stages in stem cell development. Totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent. Totipotent means total potency, and that will be your embryonic stem cell. What you can take as a doll in the shape, yes, and grow <coughs> the whole animal out of it. So that will be a totipotent cell. The pl uh, pluripotent, pluri means several, yes? means, or, or rather many, means that you can take this uh, cell and grow several tissues, but not the whole body, not the whole organism, just several tissues. And the last one will be multipotent, and multipotent means that you can only grow a limited number of cells out of this stem cell. Now, the uh, hemopoietic stem cell belongs to the multipotent lineage, and the multipotent stage, rather, and you can only grow, if you take it, uh, the blood uh, cells out of this hemopoietic stem cell. Now, how it develops? It develops into progenitor, and this progenitor then uh, divides into two lineages, major lineages. One is lymphoid progenitor, and the second is myeloid progenitor. Now, the lymphoid progenitor further gives us two types of cells, and that's the T-lymphocyte and B-lymphocyte. T lymphocyte develops in thymus and has the, 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 the name T. B lymphocyte develops in bone marrow, but just for your knowledge, it's the, the name doesn't come from bone marrow. It comes from Bursa Fabricius, which is a Latin for a certain part of the uh, intestine in birds, because that's where the B cells were first identified. So they were called B cells based on birds. And it's a good coincidence that in humans, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, generally the higher um, primates, uh, the uh, development of B cells uh, is in bone marrow. So it starts with the same letter. Yeah? Uh, and the uh, second lineage, general lineage, is a myeloid progenitor. A myeloid progenitor further develops into neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, platelets, and red cells. In case of the um, uh, malignant uh, transformation, any of the immature and more rarely mature cells can become cancer cells. So that's why we have so many different types of, of leukemia and lymphomas, 
because they are based on the diversity of all those cells. Now, this uh, uh, slide shows you uh, stem cells in bone marrow growing on the stroma of bone marrow. And stroma of bone marrow is extremely important because it supports normal development of, of uh, the cells. We believe that a lot of the leukemic or leukemogenic uh, events happen because of abnormal interaction between stromal cells and the stem cells. So we call the stroma and the um, elements or the um, different proteins and molecules that stroma produces microenvironment. So we have here a microenvironment that supports stromal cells. The microenvironment uh, contains actual stroma cells plus extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix contains proteoglycans, fibronectin, collagen, laminin, and it's actually for uh, the feeding purposes, as well as for the purposes of interaction with the, uh, with the uh, growing or differentiating stem cell, and therefore allowing the stem cell to differentiate into certain lineage. So what we uh, believe is that stroma orchestrates how and where and what into the hemopathic stem cell will develop, whether it will be a, a myelogenic, a, the a myeloid progenitor, whether it is a lymphoid progenitor. So it's all done and defined by stromal cells. Uh, this is a very interesting experiment that shows you the role of stromal cells in, in the stem cell growth. Uh, that's the uh, plate, the plastic plate, where the um, cells, the um, uh, stem cells, were put without any of the stromal cells at all, and then they don't grow. They only grow if you put the adherent layer of the stromal cells and then add stem cells on the top. So on empty plastic, stem cells will not grow. They will only grow if you give them an under layer of the stromal cells. It just shows, and the interesting thing is in this experiment, you can take superlatin from stromal cells and give it to, uh, to stem cells, they will not grow. So therefore, the um, molecules that are produced by strong cells are not enough. And what is really required is the cell-to-cell -cell interaction. Now, uh, this slide also shows you the uh, uh, architecture, as we call it, of bone marrow. That's really a marrow inside the bone. And you can see that apart from strong cells, strong cells, we have a lot of adipocytes. And obviously adipocytes are for only one reason. <coughs> what they contain? Fat. Fat. So therefore, they are for feeding purposes. There we have therefore feeding cells as well as stromal cells. And as I said, stromal cells orchestrate how stem cells would develop. So if something is wrong in this interaction between stromal cells and stem cells, that's where the leukemic or leukemogenic events can happen. So as we said, we, um, as I said, we uh, believe that the microenvironment plays an important role in normal development as well as in abnormal development of the hemopathic stem cell. So uh, you can see here different types of uh, leukemias that can develop. Uh, the acute lymphoblastic leukemia can develop at the level of the called IALL, at the level of lymphoid progenitor. At the level of myeloid progenitor, we have, we have acute my, the myeloid leukemia, could be of different types based on whether it is of the progenitor that was supposed to then become a neutrophil uh, or granulocyte, become a monocyte, so there's a monocytic lineage, granulocytic lineage of acute myeloid uh, leukemia. And uh, uh, at the level of the, uh, the uh, mature, more mature cells, we have chronic conditions. We have chronic lymphocytic leukemia uh, of B cells. And we have the different lymphomas in tissues, which could be B cell lymphomas as well as T cell lymphomas. And at the very end, it is a very severe and unpleasant condition called a multiple myeloma, yet really very poorly uh, treatable. And um, the multiple myeloma is a cancer or a leukemia of plasma cells. And plasma cells are end point differentiation of B lymphocytes. 
So when we really decide to differentiate, to make antibodies, they become plasma cells. Um, I don't know whether you are taking immunology module. If you are, please remember that B cells don't really make antibodies. They develop into plasma cells, and then plasma cells make antibodies. Uh, so these endpoint differentiated plasma cells uh, can give a un really uncurable at the moment, an incurable cancer called multiple myeloma. So you can see there are so many different different uh, cases, there are so many different conditions, they are treated differently, their biology is different. So how we can find something in common? But there are some features with which there are some of those conditions share. Now, um, as I said, key characteristics of any leukemia or lymphoma is the lineage, whether it is lymphoid versus myeloid. Secondly, the aggressiveness, which is related to the maturation state. And that means acute, um, aggressive, mostly um, uh, set up by immature cells, or chronic, which is mostly indolent, as it is chronic, yes, chronic condition, and it's mostly supported or mostly uh, made up, this leukemia, of mature cells. So the more immature cells are, the more aggressive leukemia will be. And the predominant site of the involvement, uh, as well, blood or bone marrow versus tissue. So where the cells and the chemical the bone cells reside, whether they reside in the bone marrow blood or whether they reside in tissues. So this is the final kind of classification of hemopathic malignancies, lineage, lymphoid myeloid, aggressive of immature cells or indolent of mature cells in both cases. If we go down to the tissues of blood, so blood, bone marrow, and acute uh, lymphocytic leukemia, tissue will be lymphoblastic lymphomas. In general, um, it's important for you to remember that cells that reside in tissues, the conditions are called lymphomas. The circulating cancer is called leukemia. However, some leukemias have lymphoma stages. When leukemic cells go to the tissues and reside there as a uh, lymphoma stage of leukemia. So in case of indolent, in bone marrow blood will be chronic lymphocytic in tissue non-Hodgkin lymphoma and myeloma, multiple myeloma. Uh, these are two quite difficult to treat. The myeloid will go uh, into aggressive, immature, the blood, uh, bone marrow, acute myeloid leukemia. Tissue will be granulocytic sarcoma. And uh, then we have the different, uh, the um, the proliferative disorders in blood and bone marrow. Interestingly, myeloid doesn't give us the tissue-related leukemic or lymphoma condition. That's the, the, the empty space, let's say, uh, fortunately. Now, the frequency shown in here, if you are interested in statistics, so um, and the percentages are more interesting, <coughs> interesting, of course, because that's out of how many cases doesn't matter. Lymphomas, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, we have up to 50% of the cases. They are the chronic leukemia, myeloid, and CLL, to about to the 30%, and so on and so on. So you can see that uh, some of the lymphomas and some of the chronic conditions are more frequent uh, compared to acute conditions. Now, the uh, first feature that I want to emphasize um, regarding the leukemia and lymphoma is their clonality. So whether the condition is monoclonal or whether it is polyclonal. Monoclonal means that if the whole of the uh, leukemic uh, population consists of the twin cells, yes? So they are monoclonals. They all come from one single precursor. So therefore, they are, their clonality is one. They are very similar to each other. The polyclonal tumor means that several cells gave, gave, gave rise to subpopulations of the leukemic a leukemia uh, community, and that all leukemic cells that we take them consist of several clones. And some of those clones might be more aggressive, and some clones would be, might be less aggressive. So some clones, for instance, might lead to the more metastatic conditions compared to the other clones, so they might have more, more metastatic um, features. Uh, so the monoclonal type of leukemia is this uh, multiple myeloma. The multiple myeloma shows a spike in here. That's a normal tissue, normal tissue of the bone marrow. 
uh, the, that, that's the albumin in here, and let's see, you can see absolutely none in normal tissues, while the monoclonal, that's the gel, when we're around, when we're around protein, so-called M-spike, or myeloma spike appears. And it still is the best way to diagnose multiple myeloma, to look at, the, uh, at this M-spike. It shows a monoclonal uh, distribution. The feature two is the fact that uh, Leukemic cells and any cancer cells have limitless reproductive potential. And here we have to take into account what this potential is based on. I think I would like to come this way because it's extremely cold there. I don't want to get killed. Meaning that the normal cells, when they divide several times, they ultimately die because they have shortened telomeres. Uh, you might have heard about telomeric repeats by the end of our chromosomes before, but it is important that we uh, talk about it today as well. So uh, the um, stem cells have the unlimited uh, potential to divide. Why do they have unlimited potential to divide? If you remember, and you look at this picture here, and then I'll go back afterwards, uh, the DNA, how DNA is synthesized? The DNA is synthesized through the so-called lagging strand and through the le living strand, yes? That's the lagging strand in the, in the, on the bottom and the living strand, uh, lagging strand on the top and living strand on the bottom. Now, the DNA is synthesized in the way that DNA polymerase can only start DNA synthesis from the RNA primer. Yes, you know that. So that means that RNA primers will be removed and then the, the two um, <coughs> adjoining DNA uh, segments will be ligated by the enzyme ligase. Okay? So what happens here is that the end point Primer, the primer which is at the end of the chromosomes, when it is removed, this gap cannot be uh, filled in because ligase can only ligate two segments together. It cannot build up at the end. So there's no enzyme that can build up at the end. That means that this bit in here will be lost with each DNA replication and proliferation. And that is the high flex law, meaning that the uh, uh, the, with each uh, DNA synthesis, our chromosomes are shortened. But then you may ask, if they are shortened, then whatever genes are at the end of the chromosomes, those will be lost, and therefore the cells and the chromosomes will be damaged. This is correct. And therefore, in order for this not to happen, we have at the end non-coding long repeats, and those are called telomeres, the long repeats. Yeah? So these telomeric repeats are shown in here by fish as green ends, but they are longer, and they contain, let's say, if they contain in a certain cell 20 repeats, it means that 20 times this cell can replicate and lose a little bit at the end without being damaged. But when all the telomeres are used, then after that, the damage will come to the actual uh, chromosomes. And these telomeric repeats are of um, uh, quite um, a uh, evolutionary um, uh, concert, as we say, sequences, because they don't code for anything. They are only there to be cut out. So therefore, if you look at a plant, Arabidopsis, it's the sequence is GGGTTA. If you look at the human, it's GGGTTA, just only one T less because there is no point of changing it in evolution, since the only reason for this to be there is to be cut out, okay? So when uh, the chromosomes, when the telomeres are finished, when everything is used, then the next what will happen is that the ends of the chromatids become unprotected. They also become sticky and they fuse. And you understand that this picture with end-to-end -end fusion this picture uh, shows you the fused chromatids. 
such structure will not be able to be separated by the spindle in mitosis. Because the two chromatids have to be separated, yes? And here they're fused. So they will go to either one pole or the second pole. In other words, the one daughter cell will receive extra chromosome, the second daughter cell will be left without chromosome. This cannot be uh, allowed, and therefore a cell uh, gets a signal for being uh, for, for apoptosis and dies from, dies from apoptosis. However, what about stem cells? We just said that stem cells are the uh, self renewing. So what happens in them? What do you have? What do you know? So the stem cells have, have continuous and unlimited potential to, uh, to uh, divide. We just said that they divide continuously. One will differentiate, but the second will, will renew, will become a stem cell, will grow for several years. And the DNA synthesis is the same in prokaryotes, in eukaryotes, in stem cells or not stem cells. I'm going to call the game. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? How and why? <laughs> this, um, uh, the uh, stem cells overcome this problem, that's better, overcome this problem with the uh, um, telomeres. It is in the, in the, yes please. They have an enzyme called telomerase. Absolutely right. They have the enzyme called telomerase. And only stem cells have enzyme called telomerase, plus the, the neoplastic cells, the cells that are originating from stem cell or the cells that are cancer cells, they have the enzyme telomerase. So what happens is that the telomeric repeats are rebuilt by the enzyme telomerase. In other words, the um, DNA synthesis law is the same for all cells. The um, telomeric repeats will be shortening, when the stem cells will be growing up again, shortening and growing up again. So therefore, that's a continuous uh, situation with the stem cells that are rebuilding their telomeric repeats. Okay, so therefore, uh, we're going back here, is the question is whether the leukemic cells, in, and all cancer cells in fact, it's just not, not only about, about leukemic cells, originate from stem cells. Because what we're saying that there are two possibilities. Whether uh, either the stem cells uh, mutate, change their features, and become the uh, leukemic cells of cancer cells, or we have normal cells mutating and gradually becoming cancer cells. So there are two possibilities. And some people claim that all cancer cells, including leukemia, are only of a stem cell origin. But the others claim that there are two possibilities, yes? or the differentiation of the de-differentiation of the normal cells or the origin of the stem cell. Now we can to a certain extent distinguish between the, there are three possibilities shown in here. To the left, you can see the stem cells developing into, uh, into cancer. In the middle, there are progenitor cells, intermediate cells, such as myeloid progenitor, lymphoid progenitor, becoming a cancer cell. Or differentiate itself, de-differentiates backwards, becomes more and more like a stem cell, and gives rise to the cancer. So there are three possibilities. And to a certain extent, we can distinguish because uh, not all cancer cells have telomerase. And we can claim that these cancer cells that directly originated from, from the stem cells might be the ones telomerase positive, and the others might be telomerase. But still, it is, hasn't been proved whether, whether the, uh, this is the situation, whether we have three origins of cancer cells. And that, of course, applies to the um, leukemia as well. OK, so uh, the third um, feature that is not shared by all leukemias, but only some, particularly chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is antigen receptor gene rearrangement. Now, because we are talking about lymphocytes here, you know that the B cells have B cell receptor, T cells have T cell receptor, yes? And those, uh, in order for B cell and T cell receptor to finally establish to mature, <coughs> the gene rearrangement happens. So there are several genes that code for B cell receptor and T cell receptor, and those are being rearranged. Now, that's quite important feature because what it shows is that Interestingly, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, 
if there is a proper gene rearrangement and then extra mutations, interestingly, uh, you, would, you would have thought more mutations or more cancer. No, in this case, more mutations, it is more indolent type of the disease. Compared to the CLL, less mutations will be the less indolent, more aggressive type of the disease. That's your antibody, which is a B cell receptor. And just only one picture, I don't want to take you too much into immunology. But this is the uh, slide that shows how these um, uh, two, there are two heavy, two heavy chains and two light chains. And these heavy and light chains are coded by a group of genes. The light chain is coded, shown in different colors, by variable, joining, and constant genes. And the heavy chain uh, has the same gene groups plus diversity, another group. So those are rearranged, and when they are rearranged, they give a proper uh, the uh, B cell receptor. And they, it shows in the antibody structure where each gene group contributes to. And mostly they are contributing, as you can see, to the antigen binding site, which is on the top of the antibody, yes? So, uh, these gene rearrangements are characteristic of mostly of the lymphocytic types of the uh, tumors and normal tissues as well. So if the genes are not properly rearranged, that can also lead to the development of tumors. The fourth feature is the cytogenetic abnormalities, those you will see a lot. And here I want to again emphasize that that's common with all cancers, in fact. The, the, uh, you can see a lot of the chromosomal abnormalities and cytogenetic abnormalities in solid tumors as well, not just only in the liquid tumors. Why it is so? Because all these changes and the development of the improper development of a stem cell or the differentiation of a, uh, a mature cell causes genomic instability. And genomic instability is supporting extra mutations, and so it's like a vicious circle. <clears throat> Several, a couple of mutations happened, caused genomic instability. Genomic instability <laughs> causes more mutations, and so on and so on. So in the end, leukemic cells are, um, accumulate a lot of different mutations. Out of those, translocations are quite frequent. Some translocations are balanced on the reciprocal. Some tra translocations are not balanced, so a bit of one chromosome just joins to another chromosome. They are not exchanging material. And the aneuploidy, like the pseudodiploid or hyperdiploid or complex, or so different changes in the number of chromosomes. Now, some of those are indicative and can be used for diagnosis, particular translocations. I'll give you an example. Some of the others are just simply reflecting how sick those cells are. I always emphasize that cancerous cells are extremely sick. So uh, what we really see is that immortal sick cells, because they are immortal because they have those telomeres, they have telomerase, telomerase so they can go for, for, for long, and yet they accumulate mutations. So therefore, they're not functioning normally, they're not functioning hardly at all. So just growing as a very sick organism, that's what cancers are. They're not healthy, immortal cells that are taking over, they're really sick. And the, um, also what can happen when those translocations, the cytogenetic abnormalities happen, is so-called clonal spread of mutation. So you can see that out of the six are shown, one obviously received a translocated region, because one chromatid is now longer, yes? So therefore, it, it has been, it received a translocated uh, part of another chromosome. And if this gave this cell advantage, selective advantage, then this cell will take over the rest of the cells and then give rise to a clone of, of the uh, leukemic cells with translocation. But it's important that translocation is advantageous. So if the translocation doesn't give any advantage, it will not stay, it will not be selected. Yeah? So several uh, chromosomal translocations uh, we can see in leukemic cells. And that's just an example of what translocation is. You can see that the great point happens in two chromosomes, and they exchange genetic material. Not always this exchange is uh, balanced. 
So one becomes shorter, the second becomes longer. If the exchange material is not, is not of the same size. Now, um, this is, uh, for instance, a chromosome translocation in chronic myeloid leukemia that shows that the, uh, the, uh, the translocation leads to the overexpression of a certain molecule, or it can cause the chimeric protein production. You can see here, if translocation happened, the chromosome would be coding for a protein which is not now only blue, but blue and red together. So it means that a chimeric, a new protein is produced. And this chimeric new protein might give an advantage, advantage to the uh, leukemic cells. Like an example here, the chronic myelogenous or uh, myeloid leukemia, there are two ways of calling uh, it, CML. There is a translocation uh, from chromosome uh, 22 to chromosome 9, where the two parts of the two chromosomes are fused. And what is used are the two proteins, BCR, B cell receptor, or the antibody, is fused with the ABL protein. Now, what it actually gives, uh, and what kind of advantage it gives, this chimeric protein allows better intracellular signaling. And this intracellular signal will be for proliferation and for survival. So if ABL on its own <coughs> didn't help cells to survive, when it joined with BCR, and it joined with BCR because there was a translocation, this chimeric protein now is giving an advantage to a cell where translocation happened because it becomes immortal and the, this chimeric protein uh, signals for uh, the survival from apoptosis and signals for proliferation. Obviously, a cell with such translocation will have advantage and will survive and will take over other cells, therefore becoming a, 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 the clone. Uh, we call this translocation oncoprotein, creation of the oncoprotein, and you can see here the chromosome 9 is broken, as well as chromosome 22 is broken. 22 can say, contains BCR, the, chrom the 9 contains ABL, those two broken points will exchange, and in the end, we have the BCR and ABL genes coming together and coding for this hybrid protein. The hybrid half, half green and half uh, red. Green was the BCR and red was ABL. Now they are joined together. And it appears that joining together helps the cell to survive from apoptosis and helps the cell to uh, proliferate. Uh, we identify the CML, uh, the, the, yes, this chromosome, joint chromosome, is called Philadelphia chromosome, because first it has been discovered in Philadelphia. And therefore everyone says, oh, Philadelphia chromosome, that's enough for diagnosis. The diagnosis happens by fish. You can see that chromosome, it's a better picture here, chromosome 22 is marked by the fluorescent uh, probe, which is uh, pink. And chromosome 9 is marked by green. When they translocate, when they exchange genetic material, in the end we have a different chromosome here, 9 to 22 translocation, green and 